If you haven't done so yet, please subscribe to the channel. And if you're enjoying these stories, there's a link below to buy me a cup of coffee. This is the Hasidic Story Project with Barack Holman, podcasting from Jerusalem, Israel. This podcast is sponsored by listeners just like you. To become a supporter of this podcast, please go to HasidicStory.com. H-A-S-I-D-I-C Story.com. You'll never know. You'll never know. You'll never know. You'll never know. Shalom Aleichem, my sweetest friends. I'm recording this at the end of Tzom Gedalia, of the fast after Rosh Hashanah, and hopefully my brain will be working and I'll make sense of the stories. So this week, I have two stories for Yom Kippur, and any of the stories in the archive, I'll put them at the end. But before I begin, I want to dedicate this podcast episode to the continued success, Bezat Hashem, of our soldiers in battle wherever they are, the returning of all the hostages, whole, healthy, and alive. The full recovery of everybody who's been injured or who is ill. The comforting of those that lost loved ones and the continued unity of the Jewish people here in the land of Israel and all around the world. One more thing that I want to add before I start the story. A loyal listener of the podcast, Yitzhak Meir Malik, has a project where he buys equipment for soldiers that the IDF hasn't provided and he has a website at notesofstrength.com where you can see that he's bought thousands of tactical military gloves, tactical boots, helmets, bulletproof vests, and much more. And anybody who would like to support this project, I'll put a link in the description. This is a story that I heard from my rabbi, Reb Shalom Brat, a blessed memory, who he heard from his rabbi, Reb Shalom Karobach. It was Simchat Torah in the Soviet Union in Moscow. And as everybody knows, in those days, religion was forbidden, suppressed. But there was a shul in Moscow that the old Jews were allowed to daven in so that people wouldn't say that the Soviets were totally suppressing Judaism, even though they were. And so there was a group of Jews dancing on Simchat Torah with the Sifrei Torah, and it was raining outside. And the harder it rained, it seemed the harder the Jews there were dancing. And Reb Shlomo was visiting the Soviet Union at the time. He made many visits to the Soviet Union to teach Jews about Judaism and encourage them to not give up. And of course, the Lubavitcher Rebbe was very involved in supporting the Jews in the Soviet Union. And Reb Shlomo sees this one Jew who's really dancing with so much joy and so much energy. And he goes over to him and he introduces himself. And normally, Jews in the Soviet Union would be scared to speak with somebody who looks like Reb Shlomo, who looked like a Jew. He had a kippah and tzitziot and a beard and a big Magen David. You couldn't miss him. You know, I'll just mention a, a side note, another story that I heard from Reb Shalom. Reb Shlomo was once speaking at this big conference. It was really like a huge outdoor event somewhere in India. There were all these gurus and speakers that were coming to inspire people. And Reb Shlomo gets up on the stage and he wants to figure out how can he connect with the Jews there. And he doesn't know what to say. I can tell you from my many years of learning Reb Shlomo's teachings with Reb Shalom that one of the things that Reb Shlomo taught was when you don't know what to say or before you speak with somebody, you can say, Venoach Matzechem B'nei Hashem. It's a phrase from the Torah and the Parsha of Noach that Noah found favor in eyes of Hashem and that will hopefully allow Hashem to put the right words in your mouth. So he's standing there in front of this huge audience of thousands of people, and he doesn't know what to say, and he just says, he leans into the microphone, and he says to the huge crowd, My sweetest friends, I stink like a Jew from all four sides. And apparently, saying that he stinks like a Jew from all four sides brought many Jews to come and speak with him afterwards and come back to Judaism. So Reb Shlomo really stood out as a Jew. And this Jew that was dancing with so much enthusiasm wasn't scared to speak with Reb Shlomo, which was kind of an unusual thing because people were scared of being arrested, of course. So Shlomo says to him, what's your story? Why are you dancing like such a crazy person? And he said he was in Siberia in the Gulag in a labor camp for five years. And he was the only Jew in the labor camp. He said, you know, when you have at least two Jews... One reminds the other that tomorrow is Shabbos, Pesach is coming, tomorrow is Yom Kippur. But when you're alone, your only chance of surviving is just to focus on today. And you forget about everything. You don't remember when Shabbos is, and you don't remember when it's Pesach. 
If you start thinking about your life outside of the camp, you go out of your mind and you don't have any chance of surviving. So he said, so you function like a robot. It's like you're the living dead. Your body is functioning, but your brain is not. He said, and after five years in Siberia, two of the labor camps decided that they were going to do a prisoner exchange. And so the guards led the prisoners for a long journey of several days in the snow. It actually took them 10 days until they met up with the other group from the other labor camp. And they were going to exchange the prisoners. And there were armed guards making sure that nobody ran away. And all the prisoners were warned not to speak with other prisoners from the other camp. And so what they did is they had the prisoners from each of the camps march around in a circle. Because it was winter, they didn't want them to freeze to death. And you have these two separate circles of the prisoners marching around. And so this Jew tells Reb Shlomo, all the prisoners of his camp are walking around in a big circle. And a few meters next to them are the prisoners from the other camp. They're also marching around in a circle. And suddenly, I hear a non-Jewish guy calls me from behind. And he says to me, Psst, hey Jew, listen, don't turn your head around. I don't want anybody to know that I'm talking to you. And so the circle started going around again. And the two of them are waiting until they get back together and they can talk again. He says, I have to tell you something. Amongst the prisoners in our group, there's a Jew like you. And he hasn't seen a Jew for many years. He heard about you and he says he has to talk with you. And he said he has to talk with you now. And he said he doesn't care if they're going to shoot the both of us. Because in the end, we're all going to die here anyhow. So pay attention. When you see somebody jumping quickly into this circle, know that it's your fellow Jew. So the Jew who's telling the story to Abshalom, he says, I was completely worn out. And suddenly I see this prisoner from the other circle jump out and quickly joins our circle. And within a few minutes, he managed to get himself in a spot right behind me. And he whispers to me, Shalom Aleichem. I say to him, Aleichem Shalom. I was so happy to see a fellow Jew that I actually stopped marching. He says to me, don't stop, they're going to shoot us. And he says to me, you know, I've been in the gulag for five years and I haven't seen another Jew in all those years. And I said to him, I've also been here for five years and I haven't seen another Jew for five years as well. So then I said to him, why did you need to talk with me? Is there something special happening that you need to talk with me? And he says to me, do you know what tonight is? And I said, how am I supposed to know what tonight is? He said, tonight is Yom Kippur, the holiest day in the whole Jewish year. I told him I was never religious, but on Yom Kippur night, I would always go to shul with my grandfather. And this guy says to me, I don't remember much, but my father, he was the chazan in Kishinev. And when I was a boy, I was a wonder child. I had a beautiful voice. I was the soloist, and I used to sing in the choir. And I remember Kol Nidre. So I said to him, can you sing Kol Nidre for me? And he started to sing. I knew what a beautiful voice was, but I never heard a voice like this. It was a voice straight from heaven. And then something unbelievable happened. The prisoners of both the camps, they heard him singing, and they started coming closer to us. And all of a sudden, they started crowding around us, and they started humming along and singing harmony. And I looked around, and I saw that all the guards had put their weapons down. And this Jew from Kishinev was singing with all of his heart. Can you imagine the scene? Here we were in Siberia, in the snow, guards and prisoners, only two Jews, singing Kol Nidre on the night of Yom Kippur. All of these half-dead people coming back to life for just a minute. And so we stood there singing. And at that moment, we felt that we were no longer in the slave labor camps in Siberia. We felt like we were standing in the holy temple, in the holy city of Jerusalem. 
But then reality set in, and we realized where we were, and we were looking around for the chief officer of the guards, because he was a cruel man. And we had just violated all the commands. We stopped marching, we broke the circles, we were mixing together, we were singing, we were concerned that the guards were going to shoot us all. And then we heard shouting, and it was the captain of the guards. And he was telling one of the guards, who had picked up his rifle and was ready to shoot us, to stop, halt, let them be. So the guard put his gun down. The captain of the guard walks over to us, and we were shaking when we saw him standing next to us. He put his hand on his gun, and he said to us, What are you two Jews doing? So not knowing what to say, I answered him, Your Honor, we're singing a song. The captain said, You're singing a song, huh? And I said, Yes, sir, we're singing a Jewish song. The captain said, Okay, then sing some more. But we knew that we would start singing, and he was going to shoot us. So we told him, Your Honor... Don't make us sing, knowing that you're going to shoot us. Just shoot us now and get it over with. And the captain's voice became calmer. He said, my friend, I'm not going to shoot you. That was a beautiful melody that you were singing, and I want to hear it again. Will you please continue to sing that melody for me? And so we continued singing. And as we sang, we saw tears fill the eyes of the captain of the guard and roll down his cheeks. And we didn't understand what was going on, but we knew that singing was going to save our lives. And so we sang more and more, and everyone joined us. finished, the captain said, when you two started singing, I had an old memory. I remembered hearing that melody before. And then I remembered going to synagogue with my father. I pictured myself as a little boy huddled underneath his talus. And the two of us looked at the captain of the guard and we said, you're a Jew? And he said, yes. When I was 12 years old, I was kidnapped by the Tsar's army and I was separated from my family for many, many years. I was promoted until I reached the rank of captain. And I've made a long career of serving my country. But after listening to the two of you singing, I know that I'm a Jew. It's been at least 45 years since I had anything to do with the Jews. But tonight I understand that I'm still part of the Jewish people. And then the three of them started singing Kol Nidre again. And their eyes were overflowing with tears. The man telling Reb Shlomo the story said, I don't know if I'll ever have such a holy moment like that again. And when we finished, we sang it again. And again and again, the chief of the guard said to me, I know you too are going to get to Israel. Please bless me that I should also merit to get to Israel. And the captain promised that he would do everything in his power to help us get released from the labor camps. And it took a long time, almost a year, and we doubted that he was actually going to do it. But then a few weeks ago, we got the order for our release. And I came here to celebrate Simchat Torah with my people, the Jewish people. And he says to Reb Shlomo, Bless me next year that I be a free person like you and that I'll be able to dance in the streets of Jerusalem on Simchat Torah. And Reb Shlomo said every time he goes to the Kotel, he remembers this Jew. And he looks around, hoping that he and his fellow Jew and the captain of the guard merited to dance in the streets of Jerusalem.
have one more story for you. Oh, this is a story that I heard from Reb Shlomo, but I couldn't find the source for it. So I found it in a different source. And in the story that I heard, it was in the shul of the seer of Lublin, the seer of Lublin who passed away in 1815 in Poland, in Lublin. He was known as the seer or the Jose from Lublin. He was one of the great rebbies, and he had the ability to see from one end of the world to the other, into the past and into the future. And in the shul of the seer of Lublin, it was the evening of Yom Kippur, and they were taking out the Sifrei Torah, the Torah scrolls for Kol Nidre. And just as they were taking them out to begin the solemn davening of the holiest night of the year, Moishele, who was just a simple water carrier, who was totally drunk out of his mind, he sees that the Sifrei Torah are being taken out of their own Kodesh, and instead of realizing that it's Kol Nidre, he thinks that it's Simcha Torah. And so he starts shouting out, Ah! Simcha Torah! He goes and takes one of the Torah scrolls and starts dancing around the shul doing the kafot, going around the bima. And he says to everybody, what's with you guys? Why are you so depressed and solemn? It's Simcha Torah. Everybody's looking at the Rebbe saying, Rebbe, he's the one who's drunk. We know that it's Kol Nidre and not Simcha Torah. What's going on here? And the Rebbe told everyone to calm down. Let him be, because for Moishele, it's already time for that kafot. Moishele is already in Simcha Torah. And Moishele danced around with the Sefer Torah until at some point he put it down, totally exhausted, lay down on the floor of the shul and fell asleep. <laughs> the next night, the Hasidim were sitting at the meal with the Rebbe, the Seer Lublin, following the fast of Yom Kippur. And the Seer Lublin told them what had happened on that night at Kol Nidre. Erev Yom Kippur, the evening of the holy day, Moshe the water carrier, he heard that there was a family who had been imprisoned for failing to pay the rent on a tavern that they owned from one of the local noblemen. And Moishele went to the nobleman and he asked for their release. But the nobleman said, nope, they owe me money. And until the money is paid, I'm not releasing them. And then he says to Moishele, get out of here or I'm going to unleash my dogs against you. <coughs> now Moishele thought to himself, I can't let a Jewish family, a husband and wife and their 10 small children, to be in a dungeon of the poorest on Yom Kippur. So he starts going house to house. Being the water carrier, he delivered water to everyone. He shows up at every door and he says, please... I need to raise 1,400 rubles to save this family. The people gave very generously. Everybody's heart cried for this family. But it was an hour before Yom Kippur, and he was short 300 rubles. He went to the poorets, and he said, I have most of the money. Will you let the family go? And he looked at Moshe, and he said, I'm pretty impressed that you put that money together, but no, not until I get all 1,400 rubles. I won't take one ruble less. So Moshe, he's walking around, and he passes by a tavern. And he sees in the tavern is a group of well-dressed young Jewish men that are sitting, playing cards, and drinking. And there's lots of banknotes and gold and silver coins and jewelry on the table. Now Moishele knew that there was more than enough money there to free the family. But what could he expect from Jews that were spending the evening of Yom Kippur drinking and gambling in a tavern? He didn't know what to do. He was torn. But then he says, this is my only hope goes over to them. He says, Shalom Aleichem, my friends. He shows them the 1,100 rubles that he had raised. He said, there's a family that's imprisoned. We're only a short amount of time until Yom Kippur, and I want to release them from prison before the holiday starts. They looked at Moshe and said, get out of here. We're not interested in helping anyone. But then one of the Jews there said to his friends, wouldn't it be fun to get a religious Jew drunk on Yom Kippur? He calls out to the waiter. Hello, hello, waiter, get over here. Come here. Bring a large glass of vodka for my friend here. The waiter pours the vodka. Big glass. It might have been the equivalent of a third of a bottle of vodka. And so, this Jewish gambler, he says to Moishele, you drink this down in one gulp, and I'll give you a hundred rubles. Right away, Moishele takes it, says the bracha, holds his nose, and swallows down the whole glass of vodka. Now, Moishele was not much of a drinker, and that amount of vodka really knocked him out. But once he did it, the gamblers were very impressed. <laughs> bravo, bravo! They gave him 100 rubles. Moishele says, I need another 200 rubles to get this family out of prison. And the gamblers were very happy. They said, a deal is a deal. 100 rubles per glass. Waiter, pour another glass for our drinking buddy. 
And so they poured him in the end the entire bottle of vodka. He got his 200 rubles and somehow worked his way to the porritz. He thought he was going to pass out before he got there. But he makes it to the port and he says, here's your money. The port counts it. He says, I'm very impressed, Moshe. You can have your Jews. And the family is freed. And they're so grateful to Moshe. They tell him, we will never be able to repay what you did for us. But Moshe was so drunk, he didn't even hear them talking. And he knew, it's Yom Kippur. I have to get to shul for Kol Nidre. But by the time he got there, he didn't remember, was it Kol Nidre? Or was it Simchat Torah? And when he saw them taking out the Sifrei Torah, he was convinced that it must be Simcha Torah. And he took one of the Sifrei Torah and started dancing. So the seer of Lublin says to his Hasidim, you see, after an act like that, Moishele was already written and sealed in the Book of Life, not just in this world, but in the world to come. So he said, if you get to Simcha Torah and you feel that your davening hasn't been accepted, start dancing in Bezat Hashem. Through your joy, Hashem will inscribe you and seal you in the book of life for a good and sweet new year. Thank you so much for listening, my sweetest friends. As always, I want to thank Yitzhak Meyer for the work that he's doing, to all the supporters of the podcast for all of your contributions, to everybody that writes to me, and Holy Brother Yankee for his contribution and his support of the soldiers. May everybody be signed and sealed for a beautiful, sweet year, a year of revealed good, so good you can taste it, Bezat Hashem. Next week, God willing, I'll be back with some stories for Simchat Torah and Sukkot. And then the podcast will be on a break until the week of Parshat Noach, where on Wednesday, Be'ezat Hashem, I'll release another episode. Thank you to all of you, my sweetest friends. Take care. Gemar Chatimah Tova, and Zai Gesund. This week I'm going to share with you one new story about Yom Kippur and a couple of stories from previous episodes. It was the evening of Yom Kippur in the town of Yaroslav, just before the start of Kol Nidre, and a young Avrech, a young Torah scholar, bursts into the shul, doesn't even look left or right, goes straight up to the bima, and without any words or introductions, starts to begin the services with the Kol Nidre prayer. He sang from his heart, and he sang in such a deep and spiritual way that nobody asked him any questions. They just went along with it, even though there was a chazan, there was a cantor, and this wasn't who they expected to lead the davening. They were all swept up with the davening of this stranger, and nobody recognized him, and nobody knew who he was. But clearly, he was a very special neshama, a very special soul. And after the evening prayer ended, this surprise cantor chanted all of the shirei yichud, 
all of the songs of unity, and then began reciting Tehillim psalms, one after the other, all while standing. And the members of the shul came back in the morning, and they see the mysterious cantor, still standing on his feet, still absorbed in prayer. He hadn't stopped the entire night, and apparently he hadn't sat down the entire night either. And as soon as there was a minion, there were ten Jewish men in the shul. The mystery guest started to lead Shachrit, the morning service. Then when they got to the Torah reading, he read the Yom Kippur section by himself. He also chanted the Haftarah. He led the Yizka service. And then immediately afterwards, he began Musaf, which is a very long davening. And at this point, the members of the shul didn't understand who was standing there. How could a human being stand in daven for so long? And it wasn't just that he was standing there. His voice and his stamina just got stronger and stronger as the day progressed. There were times when the mystery chazen would be quiet and the congregation sang and they found themselves, through his leading their davening, reaching spiritual heights that they had never reached before. And they weren't sure, was this a human being or an angel? And as the day came to a close and everybody came for the Nila prayer, the last prayer of the day, the fifth prayer of Yom Kippur, everybody was swept up with the singing and the spiritual fire coming out of this mystery chazan who just came out of nowhere. And as he stormed the gates of heaven, asking Hashem to bring the Jewish people in the merit of their tshuva, complete salvation, everyone was sure that this couldn't be a human being. It had to be an angel. And one of those people that was present was Rabbi Yaakov Meshulam Orenstein, who passed away in 1839. And he was the author of Yeshua Shiakov, and it's from him that we know the story. And after the services ended, Rabbi Yaakov Meshulam decided to follow this mystery guest back to where he was staying to see if he was going to eat something or not, because that way he would know if he was a human being or an angel. And he saw how he heard Havdalah, which officially ends the fast in Yom Kippur. He heard it from other people, and then he asked his host for some kfikinish, a tasty morsel, to refresh his soul since it was hungry. And so they happily gave him some cake and fruit, but they were shocked when he said, No, this is not what I mean. I mean, bring me a Gemara Sukkah, the tractate of the Talmud that talks about the festival, which comes four days after Yom Kippur. And carrying the large volume of the Talmud under his arm, he went to his room, saying that he wanted to rest. But Rav Yaakov, he looked in the keyhole, and he saw that the mystery Chazan opened up the Sefer, the Talmud and started to learn with such an enthusiasm and excitement. He didn't pause for one minute. Rabbi Yaakov himself was so exhausted he couldn't stay awake. And so he went and broke his fast and went to sleep. But early in the morning, he decided to go back to the room of the mystery Chazan and see if he was still learning. And he saw that he was about to complete the final page of the Talmud and Sukkot. And only after he finished the entire Masechet did he come back into the dining room and ask for a cup of coffee and a little bit of cake. And this mysterious chazan turned out to be none other than the great Rebbe, Rabbi Levi Yitzchak Berdichev, who would eventually become one of the greatest and most beloved Hasidic masters of all. And his son writes about him in the introduction to his own book, Keser Torah, that he raised up thousands upon thousands of Hasidim and ignited within them a passion for learning Torah and serving Hashem with love. And his own service of Hashem was so great that even the angels above were jealous of him. I bless you all, my sweetest friends, that this Yom Kippur, you and I, we daven with a little bit of the passion of Reb Levi Yitzhak Abedichev, and that we're able to lift up the person next to us, in the whole row next to us, in the whole shul, in the whole city that we live in, and the whole country that we live in, and the whole world, and the all of existence, with our davening, this Yom Kippur. May you have a Gemar Chatimah Tova, written and sealed for a good and sweet new year of revealed good and revealed blessings. <laughs>
Mm-hmm. Here's a couple more stories from you from previous episodes. Every year, Reb David Laikis, one of the closest Hasidim of the Helege Baal Shem Tov, went to his Rebbe for Yom Kippur, the holiest day of the year. One year, the craziest thing happened. On his way to Mejibuz, everything went wrong. The horses wouldn't go, one of the axles on the wagon broke, then a wheel broke, the wagon turned over, everything was happening to Reb David, and he didn't understand why. This went on for three days, and he said to himself, it's been three days already, and this is making me crazy. I don't understand what's going on here, but I have to make it to the Helig Abal Shem Tov for Yom Kippur. Finally, finally, he was just two miles away from Mejibuz. It was maybe 20 minutes to get there, and 20 minutes until Yom Kippur. He said to himself, thank God, if I go really fast, I can make it on time. He was mamish crying and begging the horses. He said, please, please make it there. And please don't anything go wrong. We have to get to Mejibuz before the sun sets. Suddenly on the side of the road, he sees nine people running across the field from a little village, waving towards him. And they were standing there on the road by the time he got there. Even though he knew he had very little time left until Yom Kippur, He decided against his better judgment to stop and ask them what's going on. And these nine Jews said, listen, we're only nine Jews living in this village here, and we need one more person in order to have a minion for Yom Kippur. Now, you probably know that Jews need ten people in order to say certain prayers together. Do you know why ten is such a special number? It's not like two, three, four, or five. It's the first number that's plural. And at the same time, it's also single. One, ten, twenty. So ten is a unit. It's the first number that reveals the multiple nature of God's oneness in the world. So we need 10 people to pray together. And these nine Jews were mamish begging Reb David. They said, please stay with us for Yom Kippur. And Reb David said, are you crazy? Do you know for the last three days what I've been through? Also that I could be with my holy master and Mejibuz for Yom Kippur? I'm sorry, friends. Please don't be angry with me. But what you're asking is just too much. I can't help you. And of course, these nine men were totally disheartened. They walked away disappointed, not knowing what they would do. And Rev David, he called out to his horses, Let's go! And he starts galloping away. He arrived in Mejibuz just in the nick of time. And he saw that everyone was standing in line to wish a good yantov to the Rebbe. But when Reb David's turn came, the Baal Shem Tov somehow skipped over him. Ah! He said to himself, he probably didn't see me. After Yom Kippur, the Baal Shem Tov wished everyone a good year. And when Reb David's turn came, just a split second before he had a chance to put out his hand, the Baal Shem Tov was already shaking hands with the person behind him. So Reb David figured, okay, I'll stick around to Sukkot and we'll see what happens. By the time Sukkot came, Reb David realized this was no accident. He was intentionally being ignored by the Hele Gebam Shem Tov. So he went to his Rebbe, crying, pleading, Please, Rebbe, tell me, what did I do so wrong? What did I do to make you not want to talk with me and ignore me? And the Hele Gebam Shem Tov, with his piercing eyes, he looked at Reb David and he said, David, how many hundreds of years was your soul waiting for the opportunity to come into this world? And your whole life happened, and everything happened, just so that you could daven Yom Kippur with those nine men. And when the opportunity came, instead of taking it, you insisted on coming here. But you don't understand, Reb David. The whole reason why your soul came into this world was to pray with those nine men for Yom Kippur. So now, I'm going to daven for you. Bezat Hashem, you're going to be given a new mission. And this time, even if it's uncomfortable for you, even if it's not the way that you wanted things to be, you make me a promise, Reb David. When that opportunity comes your way, and you won't know whether it is or it isn't, you're going to take every single one of them, no matter how uncomfortable it is, and you're going to daven with every minion that calls you, and go every place you need to go. And Be'ezat Hashem, at least then, you'll have the opportunity to fulfill the purpose that your soul came into this world. It was the night of Yom Kippur in Lelov, and thousands of people had crowded together into the shul of the Holy Rebbe, Reb David Lelover, to daven kol nidre, the special davening 
and Yom Kippur night. Everyone was waiting for the Rebbe to show up. It was time to begin the davening, but the Rebbe wasn't there. The Chassidim went out all around town to look for him, but nobody could seem to find him. They waited for hours, and the Rebbe didn't show up. So finally, at some point, they had to start without him. Later that night, as the Chassidim were heading home, they looked into the window of a house not far from the shul, and who do they see standing in the window? Gewalt! It was Reb David, their Rebbe, standing in a window. What was he doing? He was holding a baby and talking to two people, a man and a woman. The Hasidim figured that that was the father and the mother of the baby, but they had to understand what was going on here. So the Hasidim ran quickly to the house, and they knocked on the door. And the father answers the door. He says, Shalom Aleichem, how may I help you? They said, listen, we're Lel of a Hasidim, the Hasidim of, of Reb David, who's standing right there, holding your baby. We need to see the Rebbe right away. Reb David, he heard that the Hasidim were at the door, and he comes over, still holding the baby. And he says to the Hasidim, what's going on? Why are you all here? The Hasidim look at the Rebbe and they say, why are we here? Rebbe, why are you here? We searched for you everywhere, and we waited as long as we could. Why didn't you come to shul for Kol Nidre? How could you miss the most special davening on the holiest night of the year? And Reb David, he looks at the Hasidim and he said, it's very simple. I was on my way to shul, and I passed by this house, and I heard a baby crying. Not just crying, but mama screaming. <coughs> and they were coming from this house. So I knocked on the door and waited, and nobody answered. In the meantime, the baby is continuing to cry. Then I saw that the door wasn't locked, so I let myself in. And I see this beautiful baby, all alone, yelling at the top of his lungs. So what am I supposed to do? I'm, I'm going to go to shul? No. I picked up the baby boy, and I held him, and I walked with him until he fell asleep. And then I stayed with him until his parents came home from shul. That's all very beautiful, said one of the other Hasidim. But tell us the truth. Wasn't it hard for you, Rebbe? I mean, in shul, the davening was so high. It was so inspiring. And normally, you lead the davening for thousands of people. And here you were, all alone, in this house, with a little baby. You gave up the davening of Kol Nidre. Your mamish gave everything up. Then the father broke into the conversation. and He said, it's all our fault. And Rebbe, we're so sorry to put you through so much trouble. You see, our baby boy, he almost always sleeps through the night. And we really wanted to go to shul. So we said, we'll put him in bed. We'll wait half an hour. And if he doesn't make any noise, we'll probably be safe to go to shul and daven a little bit. And then come right back home. We never imagined that he'd wake up and cry. Reb David, he looked at the parents and he looked at the Hasidim. He said to them, none of you understand. It wasn't any trouble. I didn't give anything up. And for sure, I didn't pray alone. I was with this beautiful baby. Can you imagine how hard I prayed? Holding this baby in my arms. It was the highest, deepest davening of my whole life. I poured out my soul to Hashem like I never did before. You thought that you can daven high when you're holding a Sefer Torah? You can daven even higher when you're holding a beautiful Jewish baby. Don't you see, the Rebbe said, davening is very important. But it's not the only thing. Even on Yom Kippur, would the master of the world have been happier with me if I had left this crying baby all alone so that I could go pray in shul? Or was he happy with me that I was taking care of one of his creatures, just like he takes care of all of us and all of everything? So the truth is... I was ready to not daven at all. If the baby cried the whole time, I was ready to stay here and play with this baby and walk this baby until his parents came home. And for me, that was the highest davening. The highest kol nidre I ever had was tonight when I was with this little baby boy. So you see, my friends, everyone wants to be holy. You can work on yourself all the time and try to guard yourself from anything that might bring you down. And that's very special and very beautiful. But there's another way to be holy, a different way to be holy. It's when you're ready to give everything up. You're ready to give up your davening, your learning, every level that you've achieved in order to help your fellow Jew. And the truth is, the level you reach when you're willing to make your own personal holiness smaller for the sake of another person, that's beyond everything else. <laughs> Oh, 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 oh,
There was once a poor Jew who lived on a field in a small house rented from the local landlord. And this poor Jew and his wife had one child, a boy. And the landlord really liked having this Jew and his family on his property. He treated them kindly and would bring them gifts every now and then. And really treated the father like a good friend. And then, tragically, one day, as it happened sometimes, the father passed away, leaving a young widow and his young boy. And the widow, the mother and the wife, was so heartbroken when her husband died that she also died, chas v'shalom. And her son was left without any parents. But the landlord, he loved the parents and he loved the boy. And not having a family of his own, he decided to adopt the boy as his own child. And since he was so young, he didn't know his parents. The only father he ever knew was the landlord, his adopted father. And he treated the boy whose name was Yosele like his own son, like his own flesh and blood. Didn't bother him at all that the boy was Jewish. He took him to church. He fed him treif. He dressed him in the finest clothes and sent him to the finest schools. And one day, as Yosele is playing with some of the local boys, one of the boys got angry at him, and he called him a Jew. He called him a dirty Jew. And Yosele, not knowing that he was Jewish, didn't understand why this boy would call him something like that. So Yosele ran back to his father, and he says, Father, I don't understand. The boy called me a dirty Jew. And the father said to his adopted son, Don't pay any attention to them. He didn't mean it. You're my own flesh and blood. You're my only relative, my only child. You know that you're the only heir to all of my property, all of my buildings, vineyards, all of my lakes and forests, everything. It's all in your name. So what difference does it make if some little boy calls you a Jew? What difference does it make? You're one of us. But Yosele says to his father, please tell me the truth. Am I really a Jew? And the father said, no, you're my son. I'm not a Jew. And you're not a Jew. But Yosele couldn't get it out of his mind. Why would this boy call him a dirty Jew if he wasn't really a Jew? And he kept saying to his father, Please, it doesn't make any sense. You have to tell me the truth. And after enough time, the foster father had to admit that he wasn't actually his own flesh and blood. But both of his parents had passed away when he was just a tiny boy. And so he adopted Yosele and treated him as his own. So Yosele said to his father, Please tell me more about my parents. What can you tell me about them? He said, Your parents were very honest and hardworking people, but they had no money. They were so poor. They didn't leave you anything. The only thing they left you was an old book in an old ragged sack. And Yosele says to his father, Can I please see them? And the father goes, brings this old book in this worn down little sack. And when the boy takes the book out, he sees that it's a machzor, it's a prayer book for the high holidays. And although it's all written in Hebrew, on the title page, it says in Russian what the book is. And inside the worn out bag is a shawl, a talis, with the tzitziot. And it's old and worn down as well. And it has strange letters on it. But Yosele knows these belong to his parents, and he took the machzor and the talis in its bag and put it in a special hidden spot in his room. And every night he would take them out and look at them and smell them and try to imagine his parents. And one day Yosele is playing in the street, and he notices there's some Jewish families on wagons ready to start a trip. So he goes over to them, he says, are you going to the fair? And they said, no, Yosele. We're going to a nearby village because it's almost the holiday of Rosh Hashanah. And he said, what is Rosh Hashanah? What does that mean? And they said, it means that it's the Jewish day of judgment, the new year for the Jews, that God has holy books in heaven. And he opens up the books and sees all of the deeds that every Jew has done over the past year. And he judges each person individually. Then the family realized they probably overstepped their bounds. They're telling Yosele too much, and he might go back to his foster father and discover that he's a Jew, and they'd get in trouble. So they wished him a farewell, and they got in their wagons and rode away. Now Yosele's heart was pounding. The Jews have holidays, and the day of judgment for the Jews is coming, and I don't know anything. He went back home and took out his machzor and his talis, and he fell asleep with them next to his head. And that night, a man comes to him in a dream, 
and he says, my son, I'm your father. Yosele, you're a Jew. You need to go to shul, to the synagogue, and pray with the other Jews. And don't worry if you don't know anything. I promise you, God will listen to your prayers. And Yosele woke up in a cold sweat. <gasps> and he kissed the machzor and the talis. And he said, Hashem, please, you have to help me. I don't understand what's going on with me. And the next night, he had another dream. And this time, his mother appeared to him in the dream. And she said, my sweetest, dearest son, Yosele, you're a Jew. In your place is amongst your brothers and sisters, the Jewish people, and not in the house of the Gentile landowner, even though he's a very good, sweet man, and he's taking care of you. Today is Rosh Hashanah all over the world, and even up here in heaven. Go and join your brothers for Rosh Hashanah. It's not too late. And so Yosele woke up in the morning, and he was scared to tell his foster father what had happened. But then his father went hunting, and Yosele was left all alone. And he's thinking about the dreams in his parents, and he makes up his mind. He grabbed his two most prized possessions, the talis and the machzor. He left a note for his father. Father, I'm going on a journey to discover my Jewish roots. I promise you I'm okay, and I'll be fine, and I'll come back afterwards. Don't worry about me. And he ran out of the house. He ran through all the fields. He ran in the forests. He only stopped every now and then to rest a little bit. And he kept walking for many days until he finally reached a city. When Yosele reaches the city, he says to people, Is there a synagogue here? Are there Jews here? And they said, No. But they said, Not far from here. There's another city. And there there's Jews. So tired and broken, he reaches the other city just after the sun is setting, and he goes into the shul, and it's a large room, and everyone is dressed in white. It was now Erev Yom Kippur, the night of Yom Kippur, and the congregation was singing Kol Nidre. <laughs> Yosele was listening to the davening, listening to the melody, and he felt his heart crying for Hashem. He was overflowing with emotions and a desire to be part of the congregation. He wanted to daven with everyone, but he didn't know how. And his pain shook the heavens. And that night on Yom Kippur, in Mejibuz, the Heilig Baal Shem Tov was also bringing in the holiday. And as he stood in the base midrash, wrapped in his talus and kittel, the Hasidim could see that something was wrong. Something was troubling their Rebbe, and they could see it on his face, but they were too scared to ask him. And the congregation sang Kol Nidre, and all of the davening on the night of Yom Kippur. And the whole time the Hasidim are watching the Baal Shem Tov's face, and he has a pained expression on his face. And then, towards the end of the davening, a huge smile comes across his face. The rest of Yom Kippur, the Baal Shem Tov davened as usual with his holy fire and was smiling the whole time. And Motzei Yom Kippur, after Kiddush Levana, after blessing the new moon, the Baal Shem Tov says to the Hasidim, you probably wonder why I had this worried look on my face. And then a big smile afterwards, and they kept smiling through the whole Yom Tov. So now I'll share with you, my sweetest friends, there was an orphaned boy who was taken in by the landowner on the land where his parents lived. And he was raised as a non-Jew and then discovered that he was Jewish. And he took his parents, Machzor and Talis, and walked for an entire week until he got to shul. And he hears the davening and he wants to participate with everyone, but he doesn't have the words. And at some point, he opens the Machzor and holds it in his hands, and he says, Master of the universe, I don't know how to pray, or what to say, or what to ask for. I don't know what it is to be a Jew, but God, I have this prayer book, and it belonged to my father and mother, and I wish I knew what to say, but this prayer book has everything in it, all the letters and all the words. So I'm begging you, Hashem, please arrange the letters and words into my prayer. And then he put his face into the machzor and cried and cried until the pages of the machzor were soaking wet. And at that point, there were tears in the eyes of the Hasidim of the Baal Shem Tov. And they said, Rebbe, but what will be with this boy? 
And the Rebbe said, I've already taken care of it. And of course, the boy came back home. He also came back home to his father. But he was changed, and he seeked a teacher. And the Baal Shem Tov had sent one of his young Hasidim, who shows up one day at the house of the landlord. And when the landlord sees a proper Jew standing at his door, he calls Yosele, and he says, Yosele, apparently God listens to your prayers. And this Hasid and Yosele sat and learned for many months until eventually, with the father's permission, Yosele came to Mejibuz and learned with the Baal Shem Tov and eventually became a rabbi who taught other Jews. And he would always say, now that I've learned so much and I can read the davening and I understand the davening, every year when Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur come, I say to Hashem, please take the letters and the words of this machso and turn them into the prayers of my heart and bless us all with a good and sweet new year. On 
Oh, 